Hello, my joy friends, and welcome to Cup to Hook Bible Chats. My name is Cynthia with Cynthia's Joyful Creations, and today we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 5. It's entitled Life in the Spirit. There are 33 verses in chapter 5. Before we get started, let's just open up in prayer. Dear Father God, we just come before you, Lord, just humbled with an open heart and open ears, Lord, ready to be silent, ready to listen, ready to learn. So as students of your word, as servants of your kingdom, we are ready to grow in wisdom and nurture that wisdom through love and understanding. Lord, there are so many things that are going to try to distract us. Phones ringing, children calling us. Just life. But help us to stay focused and determined to study your word, Lord, because it is so important that we remain grounded in your word so that we can walk in fellowship with one another loving one another, guiding one another, holding each other accountable, and making sure that all of us understand the glory of your grace. We love you, Lord, and we ask all of this in your name and your wonderful son's name. Amen. Okay, you guys. Chapter 5 is full of a lot of stuff. Not that the other four chapters haven't been, but we probably could have made two Bibles chats out of this chapter. But we're going to dive into it and we're going to go through all 33 verses today. All right, we're going to start with verses 1 through 2. And it says, Follow God's example, therefore as dearly loved children... And walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. In the King James Version, it says, be imitators. What is an imitator? Well, children are natural imitators. They imitate their parents and other adults that are in their life. We are also to act according, as children of God, to imitate Him. And as we imitate Him, we become representatives of God. Especially for people who have turned away from God and shut Him out. And believe it or not, there are still people who don't even know who He is. And so we need to live out our lives so that people will see God's character reflected in ours. I'm going to reread verses 1 through 2. Those are some of the verses that we're going to highlight for this week. So I'm going to reread them because of their importance. It says, follow God's example. Therefore, as dearly loved children, be imitators. And first off, we can't fully follow God's example if we're just trying to live life and do good. If we're trying to love others and forgive. We have to fuel our hearts. And the way we fuel our hearts is by studying His Word. And with that knowledge and that wisdom... We're able to be imitators, representatives. God forgave you. Oops, sorry. I was reading part of the verse from last week, but God did forgive you. <laughs> so be imitators and walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up, as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. All right. We're going to look at verses 3 through 4. But among you 
there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. All right. So Paul listed a couple things there that as Christians, we are not to have a part of. It shouldn't be a part of who we are. It should not be um, a part of our, our representation of God. And first off, he said sexual immorality. Okay. Another word for this is fornication. And this is a broad word describing sexual sin. And then he said any kind of impurity. Okay. Another word for this is uncleanness or uncleanliness. And it's another broad word for the word dirty. And what it means is moral behavior, especially in a sexual sense. And then he says, or of greed. Another word for that is covetedness. We are not to be filthy, meaning the same as uncleanliness. We are not to have any kind of dirty moral behavior, especially that in an inappropriate sexual sense. Then he says, nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking. No coarse joking or gesture. And that is inappropriate, impure sexual humor. Christians are to give thanks for sex. Really? Yes, of course. Because God has designed sex to be a gift. Something special between two people and they're to enjoy sex in a way that glorifies the giver and the giver being God. So God has actually given us sex as a form of enjoyment, gratification, but when done in the right way. All right, moving on to verses five through seven. For of this, you can be sure no immoral, impure, or greedy person, because such is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Idolatry. It says that these people are considered an idolater. When you think of idolatry, what do you think of? You think of someone who, you know, worships any other idol that is not God. But idolatry is a much bigger perspective than that. Because idolatry happens in more subtle ways than just bowing before a statue. And so that's what Paul is trying to teach us. Okay. Anything that's not of God, anything that's not a representation of God should not be a part of our life because it does not give that pure representation of who God is. And then it says, therefore, do not be partners with them. It means do not associate with them. And there's a reason for that. And we're going to talk about that just a little bit further on. Um, but before I do, I want to just, before we go into the next little section, I just want to come back to being imitators. Paul is once again describing how we should relate to one another. God is so much more than our example, okay? We're not saved by the example of Jesus, but once we're saved, his example becomes so much more meaningful to us. When we walk in love, 
which is the same kind of self-giving love as Christ, we can give the same sweet-smelling aroma that he did when he gave his self in love for us on that cross. And when we emulate him, when we imitate him, we're giving that same sweet-smelling fragrance when we give ourselves in love to others. Now, when I'm talking about in love to others here, I'm not talking about in the sexual sense. I'm talking about in the Christ-like sense. God doesn't ask us to lay down our life in a dramatic way like he did ask of his son. But little by little, through acts of love and service. All right, moving on. We're going to look at verses 8. Sorry, my eye was itching. 8 through 12. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. All right? I actually read verse 13 with that. I apologize. All right. Christians need to recognize that this same darkness that Paul is talking about it's the same darkness that we actually emerge from. Before we were saved, before we gave our life to Christ, we were in that darkness. But what he's taking us a step further to realize is we were not only in that darkness, okay, but we were a part of that darkness. So it's two different things. But once we were enlightened... We were to walk as children of the Lord in the light. Paul doesn't only say that we were once in darkness. He said we were once part of it itself. And now that we are not only in the light, but we are in the light in the Lord. Amen? Because now we are representatives of God. And then it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. We're going to flip over um, to Galatians chapter 5, and we're going to look at verses 22 through 26. Now, the book of Galatians is right before the book of Ephesians. So just turn back um, a couple pages, and we're going to look at verses 22 through 26. And it says, but the fruit of the Spirit, I'm just going to read this slow because I want you to take it in. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. You guys, we're going to highlight verse um, 22 and 23 and it says but the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace forbearance kindness gentleness faithfulness and self-control and goodness and against such there is no law All right, 
looking at verses 13 through 14. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. And everything that is illuminated becomes a light. And this is why it said, Wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Verse 14, we're going to highlight as well. Wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead. Come out of the darkness and Christ will shine on you. You will walk in the light. Christians need to recognize that this is the same darkness that they emerge from, right? And it's the same darkness that they're a part of. But unfruitful works, we can't have it both ways. We can't be a part of the dark and we can't be part of the light. It, it just doesn't work. You're either in the dark or you're in the light. You're either warm or you're cold or hot or cold. I mean, God doesn't even want us lukewarm. It's one way or the other. You cannot have your cake and eat it too. And if you're in the darkness... It says you are doing unfruitful works and they're going to be exposed. Even if you think they're secret, even if you think you're keeping it from everybody, everything eventually comes to light. That lie you told, eventually the truth will come to light because you can't remember a lie forever and you can't remember who you told. So something that seems as simple as that it doesn't matter what it is. Everything eventually comes to light. It will be exposed. And as Christians, we should therefore not be associated with it. If we know somebody is choosing of their own free will to do something that is not in line with God, it is not part of that light life. We should not be there because when it's exposed, we don't want to be that deer caught in headlights because that's not a representation of God because that is not who God is. So we need to avoid unfruitful works. And as it said back up in verse um, 7, do not be partners with them doesn't mean you can't love them. It doesn't mean you can't pray for them. It doesn't mean you cannot show them God's love. Because after all, they're separated from him, right? They're lost. They need him. It's our responsibility to share him. But we have to be wise. We have to have discernment. Trust me, people are always watching us. They watch to see how we fall. They watch to see how we rise. They watch to see how we live on Sundays. And they watch to see how we live on Fridays. We're always being observed. And that's why it's important, going all the way back to verse 1, that like children, children of God, we are to be imitators of of who he is and the Holy Spirit. All right. Looking at verses 15 through 17. It says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as the wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. And then verse 17 says, Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. So we're also highlighting verses 15 and 16, and I'm going to read those again. And I want you to just close your eyes a minute. Close your eyes and let me slowly read these words to you because they are valuable. This is like the meat and potatoes. You know, being the imitators, that was, you know, the appetizer. But now we're into the full course meal. And 
this is what I want you to hear. So close your eyes, block everything out. It says, be very careful how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Live a life that shows God's wisdom. Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Every opportunity of what? Every opportunity to share God's love and grace. To share that this God not only wants to provide and protect, He wants to forgive and forget. He wants to fill your days with joy and blessings beyond your imagination. He wants to walk and talk with you. He wants the most intimate relationship that you have in your life. The light has been given to us. It's a gift as well. And when that light has been given to us, then we should walk carefully and wisely. We are not children without hope. We are not children without a future. We are not children without direction. Because if we are living in the light, God is going to give us his will and we're going to obediently follow. We're not going to go kicking and screaming and throwing temper tantrums. No, because we're wise. And we're going to be, okay, Lord, I am trusting you. You have given me this life and it's a gift. And you've given me the light of your son through the Holy Spirit. And that is a gift. And I, in return, am going to show love and respect to you. And I'm going to follow you. And as our relationship builds and grows and becomes intimate, I am going to turn to you for everything. I'm going to walk and talk with you. I'm going to laugh and cry with you. I am going to sing and praise and worship your name. I am going to seek you for every need and every want and every desire that I have. And because I have wisdom, I'm going to trust you that when the answers don't come in my timing, that I understand that they will come in the perfect moment of your timing. And when they don't come from where I expect them to come from, it doesn't mean that you don't have my best interest. It doesn't mean that you're not looking out for me. It doesn't mean that you're not listening and you don't care. It just simply means that you are holding me in the position of getting me ready for the best possible scenario for me. Because he's just that kind of God, a loving God. All right. Opportunity. What does that mean? What does it mean in opportunity? It's the season of the time. And when I say time, I don't mean like what time it is. The, the error, what's going on in the world around you. Opportunity is a season of the times that Christians should redeem. We're going to take a look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. And again, Galatians is in the book before Ephesians. So we're going to flip back to the last chapter of Galatians, which is chapter 6. And we're going to look at verse 10. And it says, Therefore... As we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. We're to love one another as Christ loves us, as Christ loves the church. 
his church. So every opportunity we have, we are to love somebody. It doesn't mean when you pass by them or you meet somebody for the first time that you just stand back and take an assessment and just judge them. Oh, well, they must come from so-and-so or, you know, look at their clothes. They must be this or that. <laughs> God loved us before we were ever formed. God loved us before he ever clothed us gave us a status, gave us a family. God did not judge us. He loved us from every little detail of the design that it took to create us. And everything God ever made, he was wowed. He loved it. It was perfect in his eyes. God's love is kind and gentle and forgiving and understanding. And that's how he wants us to love others. All right, let's move on to verses 18 through 20. Do not get drunk on wine. Now, Paul's jumping all over the place. And now you're kind of understanding why I said we could have made this into two studies. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. And instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We learned last week there is power in the name of the Lord. Yes, there is. We are to constantly be filled with the Spirit. It is not a one-time event. Just like we can't just open the Bible a few times, learn a couple scriptures and be like, okay, I am set and equipped for life. Huh. You'll be sadly disappointed. You will be lost. You will be hopeless. You will be broken. Afraid. To be filled with the Holy Spirit, we have to constantly... Be nourishing our soul. We have to study his word, fellowship with others, and grow in learning how to love others as we love and see ourselves. We are sons and daughters of a king. All of us. God didn't put us in a social class and say, okay, I'm only going to spend Mondays with y'all, but I'm going to spend Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursdays with you guys, and then you guys are going to get my attention every day. It's not how God works. And as representatives who live in the light of him through the Holy Spirit, we do not love like that either. We do not classify and divide people off. We are not to pick and choose whom we love, whom we share God's grace with. He says, take every opportunity. And we're to be filled with the Spirit every single day. Not just once. We don't just open our Bible once and say, oh, I've read God's word. Mm. You don't throw an anchor out the boat and it's just the chain and the anchor is still sitting on the boat. I would say you don't start a car without the key, but <laughs> we do have keyless remote cars now, but you get my point. It has to be an ongoing thing. And you know, the more you learn about something, 
the more it begins to be a part of you. And that's what God is telling us through Paul. We are to imitate God. God is perfect, you guys. We are so not. And no matter how hard we try and no matter how much we do study his word, we will never be perfect like him, but we are to strive for that perfection. The Bible tells us we are to strive to be perfect like God. So we have to be filled with the Holy Spirit every day. The Holy Spirit guides us and directs us. He's an intercessor for God and Jesus. All right. Alcohol. Okay. So now Paul has gone from all these other things, sex, and now we've gone from, you know, uh, being in darkness and now in light. And now we're coming around and how we're to treat one another. And now we're coming around. And Paul says, do not get drunk on wine. Now he didn't say don't drink wine. So drinking wine is not a sin. But he says, do not get drunk on wine. Alcohol is a depressant. It loosens people up. And what it does is it, it depresses their self-judgment. The Holy Spirit has a different effect on us. The Holy Spirit gives us um, control, or excuse me. So alcohol causes us to, um, it depresses our self-judgment, our control, our wisdom, our balance, The Holy Spirit has the opposite effect of being impaired because the Holy Spirit is a stimulant and he moves every aspect of our lives, our beings, to a more perfect, better performance. And when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we have a desire to worship God, to praise and encourage one another. And when that happens, they will also be filled with thanksgiving. And we will be filled with thanksgiving. Because a complaining heart and the Holy Spirit do not go together. All right, we're now going to look at verse 21. It says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. What is submitting? What does it mean to submit? Submit is to be under in rank. It's a military term. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we show a submissive, we so show a submission to each other, a reverence to God, not to man. There is no idea of rank in the body of Christ. We just talked about that. He does not divide us up. We are equal. Paul wants us to take from this under rank attitude. And he wants us to apply it to our everyday life when dealing with each other. You are no better than me. And I certainly am no better than you. We're equals. And we are to love one another. And when one falls, we're to lift the other one up. And when neither one of us are falling, we're to walk together, encouraging one another. 
constantly building each other up. So when we do fall, we have that grace to know that we are not without hope. Because we have the confidence that God has our future. So submission. And we've highlighted that verse as well. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Well, going into verse 22 through 24, we're going to look at a different kind of submission, but it still holds true under rank. And it says, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands, and you do to the Lord, as you do to the Lord. That as is very important. So I'm going to read that again so I got it correctly out to you. Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. So in the same manner, the same respect, the same fear of the Lord that we submit to him, we as wives are supposed to submit to our husbands. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Submit. That can be a hard word for some people. Some people struggle with that. Not just in a marriage but in any kind of relationship, children to parents, children to teachers, employee to boss, employee to employee, who holds a higher position than us. We may have more common sense and knowledge and understanding of the job than the person above us, but it doesn't matter. We are still su to submit to their position. Submission is a hard, hard thing. We all like to think we're right. We all like to think we know it all. And most of the time, we don't. <laughs> For wives and husbands, wives need to submit to their husbands. Why? Because they're a part of a team. They're a part of a, a unit. And you are not more important than the working of the team or the unit. You know, in the Bible, it talks about, you know, he is um, the vine and we are the branches. But they all have to work together. In the marriage between the husband and the wife, one is not better than the other. One is not more important than the other. They are a unit. They are one. A wife's submission is also a sign of submission to the Lord. A woman should take great care then in how she chooses a husband. Need to have a checkoff list. Because good looking today may not be attractive 10, 20 years down the road. you got to have more than just the physical attraction. It's got to be based on more. So Paul is telling you, women, before you choose that husband, be wise about it. Don't be impulsive. So a woman should take great care in how she chooses her husband. Wives are are free from this obligation only under certain conditions. And we're just going to list them. We're not going to elaborate on them. But the only things that free her from this obligation of submission is one, if her husband expects her to commit sin. Two, is medically incapacitated. Three, an adulterer steps out on the marriage. Four, 
is violent to her and or the children. As parents, it's our right to protect our children at all cost. Doesn't matter who that person is. No one has the right to bring violence, a hand on anyone. And wives are no exception. Even though the husband is the head of her, he does not have the right to lay a violent hand on her. All right, like I said, we're not going to dwell on those, but that's, you know, keeping true to the study. All right. Um, we're now going to look at verses 25 through 29. So Paul has, has directly spoken directly to wives. Now he's going to turn and speak directly to husbands. So those of you that are men that are here with us today, this is for you. And even if you're not married right now, women or men, this applies to you when you are. So from this, if you're single, take that knowledge with you. So that you are being wise, you are being picky about that person that you choose to build that unity with, that bond, that taking of one life, another life, and merging it into one and submitting to that team, that unit. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands, you ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. So one thing we see repetitively is Paul is constantly bringing up two things when he's referring to this union, this unity. He refers to the way we are in our marriage between husband and wife is the same way that Christ is with the church. And Christ's his relationship with the church is an example for us in our relationship within our marriage. All right. Paul is telling husbands to practice self-denial for their wives. Husbands are to love their wives as Jesus loved the church. And what does that actually involve? Well, we're actually going to flip to Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Philippians is right next door to Ephesians. So we're just going to go right over to the next book and we're going to flip to chapter 2 and we're going to look at verses 5 through 8. And it says, In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset. Mindset is not just here. Mindset is here. I don't know if I'm high enough to get there. In the heart. Same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature, God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. And how did Jesus make himself nothing? By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, just like you and I. He had skin that could be pinched. He had skin that could be harmed. So he gave up everything he had in heaven. And he came down here to be nothing and human just like us. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient all the way to death, even death on the cross.
Husbands are to love and honor their wives in that same way. Obedience. It talked about wrinkle and blemish. To keep her from having any wrinkles or any other blemish. What does that mean? Does that mean she never grows old? She never has acne or scars? He's not to bring any acts of disgrace to her. That's what that means. All right, so we're going to jump into something real quick before we finish this off. There are four kinds of love. And before we get into that, we're going to reiterate. Well, no, let's do the four kinds of love and then we'll reiterate why wives submit to their husbands and why husbands submit to their wives. So let's go over the four different types of love. The first one is Eros, E-R-O-S. And it is erotic love and it's love that is driven by desire. Next, we have Storge. It is S-T-O-R-G-E. It is family love. It is like love between um, parents and children or family members. And it is driven, it is love that is driven by blood. Then we have Philia. It's a brotherly friendship and affection. And last, number four, and Philia, by the way, is P-H-I-L-I-A. And then we have agape love, and it is A-G-A-P-E. Agape love is love that comes spontaneously, without even thinking, straight from the heart. Eros love, storage love, and philia love are all types of love that is felt. But agape love is of the mind. Now, I know I said it's something that's spontaneous. We don't think about it. And, it. and it is. But it's not based on an emotion. It doesn't have anything to do with feelings. But it has everything to do with decisions. Agape love. It's a love that loves without changing. Agape love is love that loves even when it's rejected. A love that loves without changing. A love that loves even when rejected. Why should wives love their husband or submit to their husbands? Three reasons. Number one, it is obedience and respect to Jesus. Number two, the husband is the head of the wife. Number three, relationship of the husband and wife is a model of the union between Jesus and the church. Why should husbands submit to their wives? Well, there's three reasons as well. One, because this is what love is. Isn't that beautiful? Number two, relationship with the husband and wife have a pattern. And as we know, that pattern is the relationship that Jesus Jesus has with his church. And number three, because the woman and the man are one. She is part of him. Just as Eve was part of Adam from his side. When God took one of Adam's ribs and created Eve, it makes them one. That's why it says, husbands, love your wives as your own body. Because she was made from your body. Closing out with verses 30 through 33. It says. For we are members of Christ's body. For this reason a man will leave his father and mother. And be united to his wife. And the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ in the church. However, nevertheless, 
However your Bible puts it. Mine says however. I think King James says nevertheless. Each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself. And the wife must respect her husband. Okay. So there's kind of some joke, you know. And I say joke. Humor. That Paul kind of got off on a tangent, you know. He was really big about, you know, as we learned in the beginning of Ephesians. He was all about building the church. And in that our love for one another. But now he's bringing our marriage, our husbands and our wives, and putting them in that same love of the church as Jesus has with his church. And so verse 33, he's kind of getting back around. So, okay, so we were talking about marriage. So back to marriage. However, nevertheless, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself. And wives, you must respect your husband. Oneness in marriage. What does that mean? First off, there has to be a leaving. Where you leave your former associations. And then from leaving, there has to be a cleaving. And what is cleaving? It's joining together as one. So what is marriage? It is a leaving and then a cleaving. Leaving your former associations, your family, your father and your mother. A man should leave his father and his mother. And so does the wife. And biblically, it's right for her to take on his name. And then they cleave to one another. They become one. They become a team. They become a unit. Whatever one does, the other knows because they move as a unit. That is what God has designed in marriage. And Paul does a good job of, yes, representing Jesus and his church in that same way man and woman should be. And finally, Paul is talking about unity in our relationships. We must have unity. And what is unity? Unity is being one with Christ. We can't have unity if we got all that unfruitful stuff going on. So we got to stay away from that. And then we've got to love others as Christ loves us. And when we make a commitment such as marriage, we need to love each other as Christ loved us, as he loves his church, unconditionally. Anyway, that was a lot. I told you, we could have probably made two out of that, but um, yeah, we're, we're coming close up on an hour. So it was a good study though. I, I really enjoyed it. Next week, we will look at chapter six and um, that will end Ephesians. And next week, I will let you know what book of the Bible we are going to study next. And you can change my mind um, in this video if you want to comment down in the comments below. And tell me um, if there's a, another book of the Bible that you would rather study or that you would like to study. And um, we can take a look at that. So let me know. Next, I am going to put up on the screen our um, uh, prayer request. Sorry, getting all my notes back in my Bible so that I have them because I like to come back and refresh myself as well. So I'm going to put up on the screen right now all of our prayer requests. If you have a prayer request that you would like for all of us to pray for, please feel free to um, type up a little brief thing in the comment section below. 
if it's something that you want prayer, but you don't want, you know, to make it publicly known, you can go on my about page of my YouTube channel and get my email and send it to me by email. And then I will know that you want that to be confidential and just I and the Lord will pray for that. Um, if you have something you want prayer for, but you don't even want to tell me or um, everyone in the um, in the Bible chat, then just put unspoken. Because after all, the Lord knows what's on our heart. And um, even when we still lift you up by name and, and just ask the Lord to be with you through whatever's troubling you, He is going to do it. Remember, my friends, where two or more are gathered, God is right there. So God is with us right now. So we're going to take a minute to look at our prayer request. And um, if I left someone off, please do not be upset with me. Just give me a polite reminder and I'll make sure that it's on there. And then afterwards, we're just going to take a little quiet time and let the music play and just talk with God. Give him your thoughts on what you learned today. Maybe there's something you're struggling with. Give it to him. Talk to him about it. He cares. He is not going to judge you. He's not going to punish you. Because trust me, he already knows. He already knows. You can't hide from him. So give it over to him. Let him help you through something. You are not meant to walk this world alone. He wants to walk it with you. If you've never given your heart to him, Today, at the end of our Bible study, I'm going to give you an opportunity to accept him because this chapter not only talked about how we're to love one another, but how we're to love Christ, how we are to give our lives and be unified. And if something you heard today made you stop and go, I want that. I want that unity. I want that kind of love. Maybe you want to rededicate your life so you're better at agape love. Tell him. He wants to hear it. He wants to know it. All right. I'm going to put the prayer request up on the screen.
Father God, we just come before you. As I'm recording this, it is actually Saturday evening on 9-11. Today is a historical day. 20 years ago, the United States was shaken, but it was not defeated. And Lord, people turn to you and they trusted you. And as we sit here, I feel the cool breeze of the cool night air. I hear the crickets chirping. And I know that you are the creator of all of that. You are the creator of the silence that we just had. And I pray that my friends allowed you to whisper into their ears. I pray that they talk to you. I pray that they open their hearts to you and share their concerns and their worries their troubles and their trials. Father, we learned a lot about love and a lot about Christian love today. We learned a lot about what it looks like and how important it is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You have given us the Holy Spirit to help guide us on this earthly journey. You've given Christ your son as an example for us to follow. He came down here and became nothing in human form so that there is nothing in this world that we could go through that he didn't experience. And then he sacrificed his life, publicly humiliated, Because he knew that his death would cover all of our sin. That it would pull us from darkness into your light. Making us spiritually whole. Father, we have so many friends and loved ones that are on this prayer list. And we just lift them all up to you. We've committed to write their names down and pray for them individually. And Lord, we trust you to touch their bodies, to heal their hearts, to change their minds, to give them discernment with decisions, to help them grow in their relationship with you. And Lord, how to not let the devil come play with them. Father, we pray for our husbands and our wives. We pray for our marriages. So many times they don't work. They don't stick. They don't fully commit. I know I pray for my very own children that when they choose to wed, that they take their time in deciding and choosing who that life partner is going to be. Lord, I thank you for Paul and I thank you for his servant attitude in making sure that we understand the importance of not ranking and underranking each other, but loving one another as you have loved us. Thank you for being here with us today, Lord, guiding us, teaching us, loving us. And I leave all of you to have an amazing week until we come back together 
And I ask all this in the Lord's name and in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining me. I can't wait to come next week and reveal where our journey is going to take us next after Ephesians. But until then, you guys, be joyful. Find your joy. Let your joy tank just overflow. And look for the opportunities to hand out that joy that you have so graciously been given so that other people's joy tanks can overflow and they can do the same thing. Be joyful, even when you don't feel like it and even when the world seems in total chaos around you. Because God's got this and he's bigger than any obstacle. So go ahead and enjoy the joy and let God do what only God can do. I love you guys. Have a great week and I'll see you again next Friday. Bye. Or Saturday. Sorry, this is coming out a, a day late. <laughs> Bye.